It's 12 o'clock in Los Angeles, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! <laughs> this week, starring Mr. Randon Purcell. Yeah, baby! <laughs> And we are going to talk about, whoops, my phone went dark on me. Let's see, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about trailers, TV cues, and sound design. The similarities and differences explained right. with special guest, once again, Randon Purcell. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they love you. I love you, man. It's Randon and I have become friends over, I don't know, like four years, five years now, something like that. Years, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, he came out to L.A., did a taxi TV, right? And then we went to dinner. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. I went home and said, honey, I'm leaving you. I've got a boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just uh, we had a lot to talk about and uh, had a really enjoyable dinner. And I yeah. got um, I'm very proud of you, Randon. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. You are one hard working dude. For those of you who <laughs> don't know, Randon truly does get up at 4.30 in the morning and works for two or three hours before his wife and kids come down for coffee and cornflakes. So <laughs> that alone deserves some sort of special acknowledgement. Um, anyway, let me, I'd like to read them your bio. So for those of them who don't know you, because I'm seeing in the chat room, everybody's like, hey, Michael, hey, Randon. A lot of our members know Randon. He's very popular with the kids. Um, he grew up playing classical piano and developed a love for music very early on. Uh, he's been composing music for well over 20 years now. Uh, it's all about the creative process for him and the joy of sharing his creations with anyone who cares to listen. Um, in the 90s, he was a, a writer member of a successful local band in Utah called Agnes Poetry. As an independent, as independent artist, they sold nearly twenty thousand albums, which is hard to do. That's you know that doesn't happen by accident. Um, they performed hundreds of shows in Utah, Idaho, and New Mexico, including some large concerts where they opened for some amazing bands like Alphaville, Machines of Loving Grace, and Real Life. For many years thereafter, he was a writer for a project band named Adam Nine or Adam Nine. Adam. Adam. Nine, Adam, yeah. Adam Nine, like one Adam Nine. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we had, uh, they had two releases, a double disc named Deluge and a Christmas EP named Momento Cristo. Since 2014, he's focused almost primarily on instrumental compositions, from epic trailer pieces to subtle drama and tension pieces. He's released dozens of industry albums with various publishers around the world and now works exclusively for a particular company, which I'm not going to mention because not only are polite, wonderful taxi members watch a show, but other people around the world watch, and sometimes they hear the name of a company and do goofy stuff like call the company and go, well, you should hear my music. So right. sorry that I can't mention them. Anyway, Randon's enjoyed placements on several networks, more than several, come on, including HBO, ABC, NBC, CBS, Discovery, Sundance Channel, Travel Channel, and Velocity. Some of his placements include a Call of Duty Modern Warfare, um, World of Warcraft, Separation, and Legacy of Lies trailers, and popular television shows such as Mythbusters, love that show, um, Vice, Big Brother, The Young and the Restless, NCIS, NCIS New Orleans, NFL Football, Late Night with Stephen Colbert and Hotel Impossible, just to name a few. In 2019, he started a sound design and virtual instrument company called Fallout Music Group with his friends Andrew Skipper, Kyle Nicely, and Simon Hagland. They build custom instruments and tools for media composers. So I'm going to get into that later. You guys, every, everybody watching the show today needs to know about Fallout Music Group because... People send me stuff all the time. Check this out. Check that out. You know, literally like on a daily basis. Right. When, when Randon sends me stuff, I'll sit there and play with it for an hour and, and, <laughs> and watch demos. And it's stuff that I'll probably never use, but I understand its purpose in life because I run taxi and because I've been an engineer. It's amazing stuff. And we'll get into it. Anyway, Randon sent me an email a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. 
Um, it said, hey, Michael, I hope you and the family are all well. Everything here is madness, but going well enough. Uh, my job's keeping me plenty busy, and I'm even doing some side scoring gigs on some movies with my boss, so that's fun too. I just got signed on to do a score for a new animated show as well later this year, so 2022 should be busy as ever. Like, you're not busy enough. Um, anyway, I just wanted to touch base and see th how things are going. Um, I didn't get a chance to hop on the, ta I don't get a chance to hop on the taxi forums much these days, but I love it when I can give back a little to ta the taxi community. After all, I wouldn't be a full-time musician without you guys. Hope all is well and that the Taxi Road Rally will be in person again this year. Take care, Randon. So I've got to tell you, man, a lot of people kind of graduate from taxi high school and big things happen for them. They don't take the time to send an email going, yo, dude, just thinking of you, saying hi. And by <laughs> the way, you know, I, you guys were the launching pad for my rocket. So thank you for that. I really, really oh, appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. No, I, I think of you guys all the time, honestly. Uh, I'll be in the middle of, of working on something and think how much I enjoy my job now for the first time in, well, ever, really. I mean, for the most part, you know. I mean, I had other jobs that were good and I liked some people, whatever, but to truly enjoy my job, this last, you know, year has been the first time in, in my 46 years on this earth that I've, I can say that I enjoy my work every single day. And so uh, many times when I stop and appreciate that fact, I can't help but think of Taxi because legitimately in 2014 I put out a solo album of like electronic kind of rock music and that was the last time I wrote songs really. Uh, I joined Taxi shortly thereafter and started going hey instrumentals. So you know in that in that time period from then until now I learned an awful lot from Taxi and like you said kind of graduated Taxi High School. but. It, all of that because of things I learned at Taxi. My first placements came from Taxi um, searches. Uh, all of that stuff built, built, built. So I, I honestly can't think about how much I enjoy my job without thinking of you guys. So well, I really, thank really you. appreciate it. Yeah. It's very, very kind of you to say, but it takes two. Um, we open the door and you, and you worked your butt off. Um, people are telling me in the chat that your mic needs to come up a little bit. Can you do that oh. comfortably on your end? Yeah. Absolutely. Let's see here. I was afraid I was going to blow things out earlier. Is that better? There you go. That's good. Uh, that folks works? in the chat, let me know if our levels are about equal right now because um, I can hard. go up a bit if needed. No, uh, I think you're probably okay. Let's see what the okay. folks in the chat tell me. It'll take like 10 seconds for them to respond. All right. All right. Okay. Marion Laird says, perfect. Um, okay better i'm getting a lot of good perfect better yeah you're fine if you want to okay. bring it up a, a, you know like 2 db more that's great. okay great anyway um well great now that we've got all that level tell everybody how awesome taxi is again no i'm kidding <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know to be fair I, I tell people how awesome taxi is all the time well thank you uh, again you know it's funny when people complain about Taxi and they think of you, I think of Matt Vanderboe, I think of dozens of other members that I know that had a completely different result than the people complaining. And I go, well, geez, right. same, same listings ostensibly, you know, who knows what they're submitting to, but potentially they could yeah. be submitting to identical things. Probably the same screeners, sometimes, if not oftentimes, again, depending on what they're submitting to. It's the same right. company. It's the same process, same everything. Some people are successful enough to launch an entire career and do nothing but music to earn their income. And other people make a few submissions, get ticked off, and go home with their tail between their legs and then trash right. us all over the Internet. So anytime yeah. you see anybody trashing Taxi, just remember, look at that guy right there, Brandon <laughs> Purcell. Anyway, um, tell everybody what your day job is right now, because that in and of itself is pretty cool. Yeah, so um, so yeah, I work on production music and, and trailer music on a regular basis. Um, different genres all the time. Uh, you know, one day I could be working on, you know, Latin American kind of style Pixar trailer music. Um, the next day, big hybrid orchestral music or horror. Uh, or or straight up sound design, building sounds for trailer editors and things like that to use. So it's a, a real hodgepodge of everything to do with 
production and trailer music really and it's that all day every day which is and awesome would you what percentage is trailer music versus production music uh it's probably 50 50. okay yeah i mean uh, it's and it's more production production ad music more than production backdrop music okay you mean ad is in advertising yeah yeah okay tv um, tv ads and so you've been hired by one particular company as like a staff composer right right yeah yeah and, and i'm assuming well i don't want to ask about your deal with them but i'm assuming that you've got regular income plus you get writer share on the stuff you put out or whatever right. your, yeah, your exactly. deal is so you're making enough i mean I, i've got a a reasonably good idea about what you used to make when you're still um, a software jockey and uh, you know <laughs> and I'm sure that you're making that kind of money or better now doing this because you don't walk away from a, a good paying job unless you've got another one I'm assuming right well and you know to, to be honest you know when I walked away from my good paying software job and I was probably overpaid if I'm being honest um, <laughs> Then, uh, well, you know, I think most software people are, are a little bit overpaid these days. But, uh, you know, when I walked away from that, I actually didn't have my job. I decided that I was just done with that industry and I was going to freelance wow. and write music. And I had several publishers that I wrote for, but nothing that was like a staff salary gig. See, I was about six months without, a, without an official paycheck there in between quitting and, and taking this job. Uh, I wasn't really planning on getting a job, honestly, until I came into this, uh, my current position. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's good. Uh, you know, um, it's kind of all about uh, doing what makes you happy. And I was fortunately in a position where, you know, my wife was supportive enough to let me jump ship on a 20 year software career Wow! Uh, in order to do something to make me happy. So <laughs> we Man. just kind of made the, made the leap. Yeah. That's a solid marriage, if ever I've heard of one. All right. Well, thankfully it is. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, um, so ba do you work from home and you get up like 4.30 a.m. and just work on music all day long? That's your gig? I do. I do yeah. I mean, I get up. Um, I keep pretty normal hours for my day, for my normal job. Um, I do get up at, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning still because I work on all my Fallout music group stuff. Um, for a couple hours first before I do my official job. Um, and then sometimes in the evening, a little bit here and there. Though that's, you know, I think as we've talked before, I always try to reserve the evening time for family time because I don't want to miss out on that. So, right. yeah, I, I get up early to do the fallout instrument building and sampling and all that kind of stuff and then and then do the day job for the rest of the day. Crazy, man. Um... But it's, it's fun. It's all, it's all fun and I'm not... Uh, not tired of any of it so well you're a lucky person uh, very few people ever get to do what they love uh, for a living and you're doing it you're right. living the dream that's what they call I'm it living the dream right so can you give us an overview of what each of the things are an instrumental cue versus trailer and tv promos um, and then sound design so that everybody's sure. got kind of a key to the map that we're going to talk about today Sure. So if I were looking at like production music, TV cues, uh, things that are going to be played in show programming, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, that's going to be kind of your simple backdrop music where you've got to leave room for all of the dialogue that's going on top of the, the music. So it's, you're only going to have a few layers of instruments, very simple, scaled back, kind of mood setting music that is not noticeable. I mean, that's really the key, right? Is a TV cue should not be noticeable. As soon as it's noticeable, the editor is going to pitch it out and grab one that's not noticeable. Right. Um, uh, and, the, and the format is, is different. You know, an instrumental cue is going to, doesn't have all the, the breaks and stops and stuff that you have in trailers and TV promos. It's more of a fluid piece of music, generally speaking. Um, and it's not going to have the big, you know, um, Kind of momentous climbs or any kind of epic feel to it or at all uh it's not like a trailer that starts small and gets big it's just kind of more one note really um that's how i think of an instrumental tv cue um whereas like a tv promo cue is going to be much more like a, a traditional trailer 
with you know bigger percussion and hits and and stop downs to make room for the editor to cut things the way they want um and those are generally going to be cut down to like 15 30 and 60 seconds anyway so if you're building music for for a tv ad or a tv um tv trailer promo then you usually don't have to be as long as a trailer um you know 60 to 90 seconds is plenty long gives them plenty of stuff to work with um, but it's going to be very similar in sound to a trailer um, but maybe not quite as beefy i guess you could say yeah um, you know it doesn't have as much low end uh, the big huge booms that you want in a theater because it's playing on some you know 15 year old tv with a tiny little speaker and a lot of that low end stuff's going to be missed anyway so um, generally if i'm working on tv ad promo stuff it's kind of like a trailer light i guess you could say okay um, the sound of a trailer without as many layers and, and largeness um and then yeah the trailers would be your two and a half minute you know big things you hear in you know marvel land or you know any of those big trailers that come out or or the big horror trailers or anything they all kind of have that same theatrical quality that um you associate with trailer music over the top huge lots of stop downs and rooms for room for the editors to chop it up and mix it with other people's music um yeah and again two and a half two two and a half minutes long and sound design would be um individual little sounds that either composers could use in their compositions or a trailer editor could drop in you know a big whoosh hit or a a brahm type brassy sound or whatever that is it's something that um you know we create from scratch not using someone else's instruments but from analog sources or uh you know nature recordings field recordings turning those into something else um to use as effects and those would be the sound design elements that we create yeah i, I think that a lot of people don't really under look i, I used to be an audio post engineer first i was a recording right. engineer working on records then I did like 10 years of audio post at a very high level. And sound design, you know, in the 80s and what sound design is now are very different. And sound right, design yeah. is something a lot of people don't really, they think it's like some guy, you know, hanging out in the studio, just like, oh, that would be cool there. I'm going to, you know, right. design a sound there. So I, I'm going to work a little backwards. I want to talk about the other stuff first, but let me go back to or start with sound design. Okay. Um, is sound design something that editors do uh, in the context of trailers and promos? Let's limit it to that. Uh -huh. Is sound okay. design something that the editors would normally do, or do you build sound design into the tracks, music tracks that you create for the promos and trailers? right um kind of kind of neither actually so okay. um it's it's something that this the editors would drop in to the trailers so like the the punching sounds and kind of well what you know almost fully fully type sounds you know yeah. footsteps and punches and things like that the editors have libraries of all that kind of stuff sitting there to use so when they're doing a trailer if they need any of that they can just drop it in and place it wherever they want it so none of that so would go into the actual music but they would pull that from a sound effects library, right? Like a poncho. They would pull that from a sound effects. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, they'll also pull from... So, like, if we're making... Um, and, and most of the big music libraries do this. Um, make sound design albums that are custom-made trailer sounds. They're mm -hmm. big booms and hits and just kind of trailer-style sounds that are kind of one-shot. The editors can just go click and drag and drop it into a, into a trailer. So that's they'll do that if if say they say they've got a, a piece of music they like for the trailer and it's just kind of a little weak. They they really like it but it doesn't quite have the power they want. They'll go drag that stuff in and just kind of layer it on top of the music um and use that. So that's kind of you know where it stands. The the what the composer supplies should just be the music, big hits and stuff are kind of baked into that music and you wouldn't ever put in punches and footsteps and any anything specific like that. It should be very musical because they're going to drop all that in to match their trailer. Um, and if you start dropping that in, you're really limiting the scope of where your trailer, your music can be used. 
It's kind of like the wind noise I've got going on right now for the show. I don't know. Um, Brandon says he can't hear it, and I'm assuming if he can't hear it, you guys in the chat room can't hear it or watching the show. But where I'm at right now, it's got 50 mile an hour winds beating against a couple of glass sliding doors about six feet away from me. And it sounds so strong that literally I'm in a little bit of fear of the glass being blown in on me during tonight's show. So you guys might actually get a better show than we normally do with some real live blood and guts. But uh, <laughs> you'll have to finish the show on your own if that happens, right. Rand. Um, All right, fair enough. Uh, I'm assuming that many of our viewers are already making instrumental cues. Taxi members are very fond right. of doing that. And, and they make them, you know, well, they, they make them for production music libraries that then get them used primarily in reality TV shows, other TV shows right. as well. Uh, and, and our members really know their way around gear. But how would they get started in learning the discipline of creating instrumental cues for trailers and promos? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are some some courses out there and things like that. Um, it, it is tough. I mean, and it, it it takes practice more than just learning it. Almost like learning an instrument. Uh, you know, someone can teach you, but you got to keep learning and keep practicing over and over again to kind of get your ears used to what um, a, an editor is going to want in trailer music. And usually, once you think you're there, you're probably halfway there. Like, you know, I think about a few years ago when I started doing more trailer stuff and I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds huge. It's it's totally ready to go. And then you'd, you'd get feedback from a publisher. It's like, no, nah, it's not big enough. It's not this. You're like, what am I missing? What what am I not hearing? And it really does just take some some time getting used to, um, you know, figuring out how to layer instruments and build all of that up to be uh, that that trailer sound. Um, you know, not to do a shameless plug, but I am releasing a course in like next month sometime. There's a new platform called masterthescore.com. Okay. They've got a couple of courses out now. They've got a mixing course for cinematic music. They've got a sound design course that uh, my buddy Simon from Fallout actually did that course. Um, and then they've got my, I'm doing a hybrid orchestral one that kind of walks through trailers, you know, start to finish for 15 hours or so. Um, and there are a couple of other courses out there, but nothing that's going to take you from A to Z. <laughs> it is really, you know, the, what I usually tell people to do if they don't want to go buy a course or something, um, is listen to a lot of trailer music and, and play the mimic game. First of all, you know, try to recreate those, those trailers with the instruments you have and you can sit there and listen to to them side by side and you'll you'll be able to hear if yours sounds thin and weak compared to the original you know you're not getting up to that level of of layering and building all your instruments up into that epic kind of sound um, and so then you can keep practicing and layering and, and whatnot but there isn't really um yeah aside from just Kind of teaching yourself and learning from listening to trailers and practicing i i can't think of any any course or anything out there that's kind of going to guide you every step of the way um yeah. interestingly enough the i won't mention any last names but there's a trailer library owner in the uk named dan and i'm sure you know him yeah by, I know by this talking about. anyway he's a, a friend of mine and he's run some listings with taxi and uh i once played him a piece of music that I just thought was amazing. It was kind of like a, uh, oh gosh, what was the movie with Johnny Depp uh, as the pirate? Uh, oh gosh. Not Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, duh. <laughs> Gee, oh, I, said, I said half the title and didn't know what it was. Anyway, it was a very uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, it sounded like the theme from Pirates. It wasn't a ripoff right. of it, but it had that texture and that sensibility to it. Right. I was blown away. I played it for some people on the staff, and they're all like, man, that sounds amazing. It's really sophisticated and full. And I mean, by the end of this thing, all you want to do is go back to the top and listen again. And I even played right. it at like the 2017 or 2018 road rally in the ballroom. Everybody is blown away. And I played it for Dan, and he went, well, yeah, it's pretty good, but, and listed off like seven <laughs> things that could be improved. It's like, Danny, right. come on, man. You're busting my chops yeah. here, aren't you? And he wasn't. He was just being a good friend and being right. completely honest. So 
I yeah. totally believe you when you say that when you think your stuff is big enough, it probably isn't. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's and and that's what puts a lot of people off, honestly, because they they kind of get that type of feedback. Wow, that sounds like a real orchestra. That sounds really big. It sounds like the movie music. And then they go pitch it to some libraries, and these guys are like, "Nah, you know, it's okay. Maybe maybe go play with it and come back in a few months after you've learned how to kind of beef it up into trailer music." Because it's it's a very different discipline than than even scoring. It's a, you know, you're not you're not writing for a real orchestra nine ninety percent of the time. I mean, we might farm some stuff out to live strings and and whatnot for it for a trailer album. Yeah. But you're usually layering that with samples, even even when you do some live strings, just because trailer music is insanely big. It's not. Uh, it's not made for a live orchestra to play unless you can bring in 60 horn players and, you know, <laughs> 120 string players and, and, you know, a full group of, you know, players doing taiko drums and, and orchestral drums and synthetic drums, you know, it's just, it's over the top music. And that's, that's kind of, you know, if you listen to trailers 15 years ago, it sounds more like a movie score. In fact, half the time it was part of the movie score. They just clipped right. down and stuck in the trailer. And you didn't think about it 15 years ago. It sounded great. But if you go back even and watch like some of the old, uh, you know, um, Indiana Jones trailers, for example, mm -hmm. you're like, wow, that's really funny to listen to because it's just a little thin clip of the, the movie score. And they just used it for the trailer. And then you listen to the trailer for any movie today and it just sounds massive, just yeah. huge, over the top music. And that's kind of what everyone expects with trailer music these days. So. Yeah, it used to be that trailers, um, I'm going to give a, a brief explanation of the process. First of all, trailers are advertising. Everybody needs yep. to understand that. The, the companies that make trailers are ad agencies specifically yes. for marketing movies. So they look at everything from an advertising person's perspective. Yep. So they come up with a basic idea for, let's say, Pirates of the Caribbean 16 is coming out. And they will put the word out. They'll send out briefs or whatever to, I don't know, anywhere between three and ten trailer music companies. Um, and the trailer music companies have several composers on their staff. And they say, okay, composers, everybody do what you think is the right thing for this. Um, sometimes the video is not even in final edit. Maybe oftentimes it's not, but they've got pieces of it. And they tell you, this is the kind of vibe we're looking for. We want it to be more bombastic or less bombastic than the last, you know, Pirates 16 or whatever it was. Um, so all those companies have an internal competition among their composers. And whichever composer wins is the one whose music is presented against all the other trailer music companies with the stuff that won under their roofs. And those are all demos. And they used to actually write checks for, I don't know, maybe five or $10,000 to each of those trailer music companies um, to pay them for the demo time, essentially. And what it, whichever one got picked, then they would have it done with a live orchestra and the trailer composer oftentimes had to go conduct his or her own composition because they knew it more intimately than a, a you know a hired conductor right so you had to be not only a composer but somebody who's capable of walking into a room with dozens and dozens of players that are getting right. paid union scale on a big sound stage <laughs> and, and walk up there and go tap tap with your baton and run that session like a beast yep. you know and now some of that may still be true to the best of my knowledge but what you're describing right. sounds more like what i'm aware of lately which is things have gotten so big so thick and lush and dramatic and bombastic that i'm guessing the turn happened over the last five to seven or eight years because there's right. an unlimited number of tracks and there are some great yeah. sounding synth patches out there. <laughs> so yep. the the days of like Indiana Jones where they lifted pieces of the score, edited that, maybe added some, you know, taiko drums to it or whatever to right. beef it up, those days are pretty much gone. 
They are. I mean, unless you're talking about like a big, you know, Hans Zimmer movie or something where his score already sounds ridiculously monstrous like trailer <laughs> music, you know. <laughs> We're all still trying to figure out how the hell he does that, but but yeah, they'll take then then he'll probably have a hand in the trailer and maybe work with a trailer music composer to finish it off and and he'd be supplying parts of that music for them to embellish. Um, but those are going to be your extremely rare cases. Um, the the process you mentioned, where you know the different companies are competing for the for the slot, that still happens all the time. It's just that at the end, whoever gets picked, it's dragging in that wave file over instead of you know hiring them to go conduct an orchestra. <laughs> you know, wow, they're just it, using it wasn't that that, the, it, that mix. It wasn't that long ago though, where it's like. I, again, I won't mention the the president of a trailer music company that's uh, very well known, very well regarded. Used to live near me, where I live in California, mm -hmm. and he and I went out to lunch one day. He came over to the office one day, and he was describing to me how there's just nobody doing MIDI stuff that's even close to being usable. And that was like right. I don't know, ten years ago. Now it's like yeah, the opposite. It's come a long way. It's come a very long way. I mean, you hear you know so so many trailers that are done entirely in the box with midi instruments wow. i mean it's it's not very often that they're using a live orchestra and and when they do it's not because they were like we want to use your song on a trailer go redo it with a live orchestra it's because they recorded it with a live orchestra in the first place right. and they're just using that song you know and they like it because it has that sound of the live orchestra um which is why a lot of companies will you know go and hire string players at least to kind of overlay their their midi on their albums right on the, on the trailer albums uh, just to give it that kind of lush realistic sound that you can't quite get with midi but well you can get really really close with midi these days and yeah i mean i know plenty of guys who have music in trailers that is all midi 100 percent of it and it, yeah. it gets used in trailers so Let's talk about the difference uh, you mentioned earlier, the difference between the enormity of a film trailer <laughs> uh, versus a TV promo because you're listening to it on small speakers. So um, is it compositionally the same? For You know what? Let me retract that question. We'll get to it in a moment. Let's talk okay. about the three acts of a trailer because... Okay. Um, that's something people should understand, and then I want to know if TV promos sure. also have <clears throat> three acts okay. as well. So sure. yes, please so, describe the three yeah, acts. Yeah, so three acts. I mean, basically, you know, act one is your trailer setup, and if you go watch almost any trailer in any genre, it'll have this really light music during the intro, if any music at all. Um, sometimes it's just some noises and things going on. Um, but it's very light because every trailer, most of the talking that goes on in the trailer is going on during the first 30 seconds to 45 seconds of the trailer. And is that most dial typical? Yeah. So it might lead off with, you know, in a world and then it right, goes yeah. in, and then it goes into some dialogue. So they're they're setting exactly. up the storyline. Yep. So that's all during act one, which means they don't want a bunch of music there. You don't want big orchestral things going on typically. Um, it's going to be more like an instrumental TV cue where you just know it's going to have tons of talking on top of it and you don't want, you know, high pitched things like hi hats and symbols and stuff going that are going to interfere with dialogue and you don't want a ton of music. It's kind of a, a backdrop um, mm -hmm. mood set for the for the whole trailer. That's kind of what you're doing is setting up the mood. Um, then act two would be kind of your in between almost almost like a TV ad space kind of largeness where it's kind of starting to sound like a big trailer, but it's not all the way there yet. So okay. you might have some big percussive hits and some synths and things moving. That's kind of like the rhythm is going to kick in. You're going to really set the momentum and, and kind of drive for the track in act two. And that's kind of, there's still going to be a lot of dialogue in act two typically. And there's going to be a lot of one-liners in Act Two if you're doing like an action Marvel kind of comedy movie where they want so to stop Act everything. Act One is the setup, saying this is what the story is going to be about, and Act uh -huh. Two is kind of part of the story, really. Yeah, you're you're seeing bits of the story unfold. So in its two. its intention is to suck you into the story more, right? Yeah, okay. essentially. 
And so you're going to have the, the funny little comedy one-liners and stuff. So your music should have, you know, room for dialogue and maybe even a couple of, of breaks and stop downs where they can easily edit it. Um, I mean, if, if you go watch a trailer, the music during act two gets chopped up so badly. It's almost unrecognizable most of the time because <laughs> they're just cutting and, and doing all sorts of things with the video. And so that, yeah, that, if you were to hear the music for almost any trailer without the trailer, you'd be like, this sounds terrible. I mean, it's just cut in the weirdest places. Once you see the final trailer, it makes sense and it all works. But if you were to hear the music, you could never create it that way. I mean, <laughs> you'd have to be on drugs or something to create the music the way it ends up in most act two of trailers. And it's is it really chopped up? Are the video editors who are typically cutting that music um, is it so weirdly chopped up because they don't care that much about the integrity of the music? They just need to work with picture. Yeah, they need it to sound good for the picture in the scene. So they'll cut it right in the middle of a phrase. They don't care. I mean, <laughs> it's it's the weirdest. The first time I heard music for a trailer without any of the dialogue or anything, I couldn't even believe it. I mean, it was chopped up so badly. And the, the, it's not like they try to do nice fade outs or anything. I mean, it is cut in the middle of a phrase and, and then something totally different will come in you know three seconds later a different song even from a totally different composer so yeah i mean it, it all gets chopped up so act two you you want to make it in a way that it can be chopped up that's kind of the idea um, that's got to be again, horribly frustrating when you have put all this work into it and then you hear it and it's like somebody put it in a blender froze it and then yeah, threw it in the garbage I, disposal <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I kind of don't care because I don't get I, I don't get attached to it like I did when I used to write songs and things like that that were very, you know, personal to me. Right. Uh, all my music's personal to me in the sense that I love that creative process, but I'm creating it knowing, <laughs> knowing where I'm sending this stuff and knowing what it's intended for. So I, I couldn't care less if they want to chop 10 seconds out of it and, and use it in a promo and and pay for that go for it you know <laughs> and i guess there's something to be said for if they find your music easy to work with easy to chop up right. that oh that's that guy again let me check out his thing right. first because he was really yeah, easy sure. to edit last time exactly so all right so yeah let, yeah let's um, talk about act three about the, that's about the same length as act one you know 30 45 seconds so you're okay. you're you're two thirds of the way through the trailer, or halfway through the trailer at this point. Mm -hmm. And then act three is generally, uh, and this is kind of true for maybe like horror and action movies more than anything, but that's your big bombastic, you know, lots of sound going on. There's hardly any dialogue in this last half of a trailer. I mean, some one liners, which they'll chop your music and just dead stop it wherever they want and stick a one liner in and then resume the music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but generally that's all the action scenes flying past your face you know it's like if you go watch a marvel trailer you can't even count how many scenes are flying past you there's they're moving right. so fast on these trailers and so that's why they want the big drums and the big hits and things flying around on screen they want the big epic music to fit this these scenes that are just flying past you and everything is big explosions and you know everything's over the top visually so the music has to be over the top to match it otherwise it just sounds like this thin little weird music going with these big heroic scenes um so yeah so act three is your giant you know maybe you'll have a little more melody in act three your your main theme kind of music would be going through here and and the main build piece is in act three and that's going to just build 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 up to the climax and then you'll have your ending after that so, and that's generally twice as long as Act Two. Oh, good to know. Um, I don't think I was aware of that, so thank you for that information. Yeah. <laughs> um, now let's talk about something that I've noticed happening quite a bit in, I don't know, maybe the last five to 10 years, even more so in the last couple of years, uh -huh. which is like, there's like a fourth act. It's like a coda yes. that happens after the big bombastic explosive third act, then there's a Boom. That's yep, basically either, opens yeah. Friday or whatever, you know. Yeah, that's like the yeah the title card ending, right? Yeah. So yeah, you'll either have that or you'll have a full-on over-the-top fourth act that's just like a little short, you know, 
four measures or something like that, eight measures even. That's kind of like a continuation of your act three, but maybe even a little bigger. And that's, you know, again, using Marvel as an example, if you think of like those types of trailers or even like DC movies, Wonder Woman, whatever, they they build to that climax and then it kind of all goes dark and then they'll come back in and just have like scene, 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 scenes just flying across the screen, all the all the action cuts and people getting punched in the face and thrown out of windows. And these things are flying past you at lightning speed just for like eight, 10 seconds. And so they'll want some big bombastic bit of music, like a big loud ending. Okay. And then that'll tail off and then come in with your little, you know, title card, soft ending typically. So why did the, the ad agencies that create the, the trailers, why do they even go to the trouble of sending out briefs to a bunch of different trailer music companies? It, it sounds like they cut things up so much, it's like you could recycle the same thing over and over and over again, and <laughs> nobody would actually pay attention because it's all about the damn taiko drums. <laughs> right, yeah, you probably could, honestly. But they'll, they'll go out just for different vibes just to yeah. get different things from different composers. And a lot of these companies, um, people don't realize within the ad agency, they might have two or three different teams working on different trailers for the same movie to present to whoever, Sony, Disney, whatever they're working on. And so those three teams within the ad agency may go out to different trailer music libraries and get music from them. So, you know, one agency could be working with five or six different tracks from composers for for a few different trailers for the same movie and then internally they might pick one of those to present to the the big wigs at the the motion picture studio so and could it be that those different teams that one team thinks it's all about the physical action another team thinks it's about wow this is the first time these marvel characters are actually funnier in in this right. than the last movie so they choose to go with the comedy because people right. aren't used to seeing comedic trailers for marvel maybe and then yeah. somebody else picks up on the love story and thinks that's going to resonate so each of those teams yeah. creates a whole different storyline with the video editing which would require different right different music yeah okay that all makes yeah. sense and and so you know the thing to remember too is and this kind of goes back to that not getting attached to your music thing um, mm -hmm. is it is more common for them to use maybe one or two acts of your song than all three of them. Like nine times out of 10, if you watch a trailer, the music you hear during the first half is from a different composer than what you hear in the last half. And, and so what about key changes? Um, they'll just find stuff in the same key or, or a lot of time it just changes key. There's enough. <laughs> You know, there's enough gap in between there that you don't pick up on it. So that, you know, they'll have um, a lot of times, you know, the, the story gets introduced and built up and then they'll have a big stop down that tails off and there's some dialogue going for five or ten seconds. And after that, they can come in in whatever key they want and you're not going to notice that it changed because you're in a totally different mindset. And, the, and usually the, the, the mood will change halfway through the trailer anyway. So, yeah, you know especially if you're talking like horror movies, you know, they, they, they come in and oftentimes they start out all pleasant. You know, the kids are playing in the yard. The family just moved to this new beautiful neighborhood. They don't realize the neighbor is a psycho killer yet. And so it starts out in one mood, but there's always these little hints of things that are going to go wrong. But then halfway through the trailer, it all kind of stops, goes black. And then when it comes back in, it's a totally different cue uh, entirely, totally right. different piece of music. And so that could come from a different composer or the same composer. They don't care. They just put whatever works with their video. Um, so there, there's plenty that have four or five different composers in the same trailer. I mean, and that's got to be kind of a bummer because for you uh, and other trailer composers, because I think most people are aware that um, trailers pay pretty well. And I think part of the reason is that you don't get any back end on theatrical release in the right. United States. So they give a much fatter front end. I mean, I've had right. friends that have gotten, you know, 60 to maybe $150,000 for landing a piece of music in a trailer, right. um, which, you know, it's high end. But so let's assume that three composers have stuff that gets in there. 
Um, right. and, and let's just to make the numbers easy to work with, because I'm not very good at math. Um, <laughs> so let's say that it's a uh, hundred thousand dollar creative fee for the music in this right. big Marvel trailer and three composers. So does everybody get an equal third or do they divvy up the money by how many seconds of runtime that yeah, your it's music more like that? Oh, OK. M more like that. I mean, the you know, the the company would generally divvy that out to their composers however they see how it was used um if it's pretty close to the same you know thirds that just split it up evenly but yeah I've, I've seen it where you know one composer has two minutes of music and another one has 30 seconds of music and they get paid accordingly oh that's good yeah. um now let's let's contrast what we've just talked about with trailers to TV promos, which are generally shorter, and, and are there any fixed times? Because TV is a very kind of regimented yeah. by the clock thing, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Yeah. Could there be a promo that's 43 seconds, or will it always be 30 they'll seconds or six? It. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and, they'll, they'll always stop it unless it's like a, a Netflix kind of streaming. There's no rules in the streaming space, right? They can do whatever they right. want. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, the ads generally are 15, 30 and 60 and they're, you know, it goes to black at 60. Like if you're not faded out, it doesn't matter. It's, right. it's gone anyway, because the next thing's coming in. Right? Yeah. So, um, but that doesn't mean like, I, I usually try to bear that in mind when I'm writing music that's kind of, kind of target TV ads, but I'm not like trying to make sure that it always fits perfectly either. Um, cause I know they'll chop it up. <laughs> if they really like the music, they're going to chop it up and make it work. Um, but I try to have enough breaks in between different acts and things that that they can they can chop it and and dice it up however they need to to fit into the thirty or sixty second clip. So you mentioned earlier that a film trailer that's going to play in a movie theater has to have you know a really big sound, a lot of bottom end. Uh, I concur with that. The theater that Deb and I prefer to go to, it's very close to our house and a very nice theater. They don't have speakers in the seat under your butt, but it uh -huh. feels like they do because the low right. end is tweaked so well to resonate with the seats that when there's a big growl like that, right. you feel it in, in your back and yeah. your butt. And you don't need to do that for TV because I'm, nope. you know, if I had to guess a percentage, maybe 20% of people watch like on a, you know, like with a really nice sound bar, or a, a right, surround yeah. system and a subwoofer in their house. You're right, most people watch with a, a 55 inch TV with the sound coming out of the back of their Samsung and yeah. yay, that's it. Yep, so exactly. does that mean that you spend less time composing and ultimately do they pay less for those trailers because it's yeah. shorter and easier to make? Yeah, they definitely pay less. Um, although, you know, to be fair, these days with streaming and stuff, uh, you know, the the days of those sixty hundred thousand dollar trailers are, you know, numbered. Yeah, <laughs> they definitely those those numbers have been getting knocked down for the last several years for sure. Um, but the, they do still pay less for TV promos. But on the flip side, you're also getting back end royalties on a TV promo end. Right. So you know and they air a lot so you know you can make up for it in that sense um with the with the royalties and do you have to think while you're composing um let's say you're doing something for a tv show but you know i gotta think about this not a well thought out question sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> but do you ever have to think of oh this could end up being used you know, on Netflix or Hulu or, or Amazon Prime. Um, but it's something that may start out, let's say, on ABC. Um, and then it's going to go to Disney Plus or whatever. So do you have to think as the composer, I need to lay this out in such a way that it's easily editable for, you know, a, a 30 or a 60. But, you know, if they're going to use on streaming and they could go 43 seconds, that it's got to have a way to make it 43 seconds. Does any of that enter into it? or I, just... Well, I never write anything that's specific to a length. Like if I'm doing TV stuff, it's kind of like 90 seconds. That way, okay. and there's edit points. So that way they can take whatever part they want. 
if they just want 15 seconds or if they want 43, they can chop it and edit it however they want. Um, yeah, I wouldn't ever do like a 60 second piece of music because odds are they're going to want to use part of it and not all of it. And then they won't have enough if they want to do a 60 second ad. So yeah, I'll always do a, do, you know, 90 is kind of my minimum that I'll do for a, a TV type album. Um, are there any other major differences in, between doing trailers and doing TV promos that our audience should be made aware of? Yeah, I mean, TV promos aren't going to have the typical three acts. You know, for the most part, they're going to be more like an act two and act three. Okay. If you were talking about, like, if you were talking about, like, even a, a Marvel TV promo compared to a Marvel film trailer, um, the TV promo isn't going to start out with a really soft, long introduction because they've only got 60 seconds to do this. So it's going to mm -hmm. come in right off the top with some, with some bangers, right? It's gonna, <laughs> they don't, they don't have time to build a little story. It's like, you need to know that the moon Knight is about to kick someone's ass, right? Like <laughs> within the first five seconds of that TV promo. So you're going to have hits and stuff coming right in. So, yeah, and yeah. they don't they don't want you to go to the kitchen to make a bowl of ice cream either. They want you to stay no, glued no. to that promo. Okay. It's, yeah, so you're um, going to kick it in right high octane right from pretty much the get-go on a TV promo. Very interesting. So now uh, let's talk about video games because I know you've done some stuff for video games uh -huh. as well. How d does the end product differ? From film trailer to TV promo to, and uh -huh. do they call them video game trailers or promos? Yeah, video game trailers, yeah. Okay. I personally think video tra game trailers are more like film trailers. I mean, you've, if you've watched them, the, the video games now are so cinematic. Yeah. They're, they're crazy. And the trailers for them, they definitely make them huge. Like, they, they want them to be film trailer music, generally speaking. So, I mean, all the the game trailers that I've ever landed used tracks that I wrote for theatrical trailer albums. Interesting. They didn't. I, I never had any of my TV stuff used on a video game trailer. And do the video game trailers have the same large S and the same big bottom um, that a theatrical trailer would have? Because those people, that market segment, <laughs> tends to watch. You know, video game right. enthusiasts are going to have a higher end audio and video That's system. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And they and you know the the video game companies can can kind of master that out a little bit if they want to take off a little bit of that low end and stuff. But, right. but generally speaking, it's always you know the video game trailers that I've landed always used our straight up mastered mix from our albums that that they came from. They didn't tweak. Or anything. I mean, they were straight up made to play in a theater, and they just took them and used them in these video game trailers. So I, I tend to think of them as no different than a film trailer. All right, we've got to stop the episode. I just see in the... I'm kidding, of course, but I see Greg Carroza is leaving early. Carroza, how can you do that? <laughs> anyway, um, also, Greg, somebody just... <laughs> Yeah, I love to embarrass Greg. Um, can you goose your volume another two dB, please? Somebody saying oh, you're sure. And I and I, I probably leaned back from my mic like that without. I know. About it. I'll I just do come that forward. How about that? All right, sounds good. All right, let me see what other really incredibly deep stuff that I wrote. Um, all right, so let's go back to sound design elements there's sound design okay. sound design the job of adding sound design to something which could be foley or could be a foley meaning like footsteps or a door uh -huh. creak or whatever or it could be um could sound design also be considered like a big drop um or um, a, a i whoosh? would say sound design is more like making that big drop or whoosh not using it like a okay you know the the composer or the editor would be the user of those things but the sound designer would be the one that made that that big drop or that whoosh or, or whatever so do sound designers kind of work in the wild uh, do they generally create libraries of sound design elements that then get plucked by editors later rather than an editor saying okay i've got the music i've got the picture but i need you know this 
explosion, which is a sound effect, but I wanted to also do right. a poo, one of those. You, um, yeah. Do, I mean, do they hire, do they contact a, a sound design person and say, can you create that for this spot? Or do they just always yeah. grab it from a library? I would say, you know, 99 times out of 100, they're going to grab it from a library because they probably got it. I mean, you know, you know how many trailer music libraries there are out there. And I, I'm not sure, but I think all of them have at least some sound design albums that are, you know, genre specific or whatever. So, you know, they'll probably just go grab it from somewhere and, and search for it and find it. But there are times when I've seen custom requests come in that are sound design related where it's like, you know, we're working on this trailer or, or even this, this movie where we need some trailerized versions of Foley. You know, we want some footsteps and, you know, uh, squeaky swings and things like that for this trailer, but we want them to be big like a trailer, not just Foley. We've, we've got Foley. We need you to turn it into something more. So but how does case. how does that person who creates the the creaky swing or you know the rock falling into a canyon and with a 10 second reverb tail on it how does that person get paid for their work is it analogous at all to musicians getting paid you know like writer share or master fee yeah, or is it's it completely exactly the same interesting like yeah i mean those those little one shot sounds that go out on those sound library albums are yeah just tracks they're just tracks and they show up in your bmi or ascap just as another track with an id and if they get dragged into a tv show or a ad there'll be a cue sheet generated for them just as if it was a a one minute piece of music but it's just you know giant swing bell whatever it's called <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's it's just another piece of music. Essentially, is how it's treated. And if it's ten seconds long, and you got and it got played in the track or in the TV show, then you'd get paid just as if you had ten seconds of music playing in there. So, if that piece of sound design is then commingled with the music, somebody's got to be responsible enough to make sure that that sound design element hits the cue sheet. Because otherwise, yeah, they might exactly. think that it was just baked into the the music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like any like anything else, we're reliant on those editors filling out their cue sheets properly and giving credit where it's due. And then, you know, like for for trailers and things like that, the editors are licensing those individual sounds just like mu music. So it's a little different, and you're getting a, a license fee that's nowhere near what they would pay for music. But um, but you know, they just pay you however you know x number of dollars to use that boom or whatever it is in their trailer but the difference is that that boom might get used you know ten thousand times over its lifetime whereas a piece of music is going to be lucky if it gets used one or two times so yeah that's the are there sound the guys thing. that create those sound design elements for libraries are there guys that make six figure or guys or gals i'm saying guys generically don't send yeah. me any nasty letters damn it <laughs> um, are, are there people who get paid uh, who earn a six figure income doing just that I, type of work i don't know anyone that does only that but i do know people that, d that do a lot of that and that's the primary source of their income yeah i mean you know, especially if you're not shooting just for trailers, if you're shooting for getting this stuff in TV where you're getting paid royalties on it, you know, that that boom, that that drum hit or whatever you made could get used thousands of times a year. And even if you're only getting paid, you know, 10 bucks every time it's used, you know, it adds up pretty darn quick. So, um, yeah, there's there's guys that do a lot of sound design albums that make a significant amount of money doing just that. So you could literally take a balloon, spray it with a mist of water, rub your hand over it, make it sound like a fart, pitch it up, pitch it down, add some <laughs> reverb, add a phaser to it, whatever you want to do, and make money yep. from... Uh, there's got to yep. be a fart Absolutely. joke in there somewhere. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's see there's if I have... always a fart joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I've covered a lot of ground without looking at my notes. I'm really impressed with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed with you too, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. <laughs>
feel um, like you needed a little validation there from someone I other do. than yourself, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, see, you get me. <laughs> um, why do you think they've walked away to some degree? Uh, earlier you were talking about how they would just use a piece of the score, which I'm sure that the, the score composer really, really enjoyed the fact that they were using... Right you know just lifting stuff and turning it into a trailer have they moved yeah. away from that just because it's not big enough and bombastic enough um is I, there any I other think that's reason? part of it i mean it's because the score music is not made to be advertising music i mean at the end it's like you said trailers are ads and a score is not advertising it's very specific setting the mood of each scene of that movie so you know to go and hack up a, a score to try to turn it into a trailer it just doesn't work. I mean, with things like Indiana Jones, it, it works a little better because there's that extremely noticeable theme, a recognizable right. theme that is Indiana Jones. Thank you, John Williams. And, <laughs> you know, you could stick that in the trailer today, even though it's not big and bombastic. Probably no one would care, honestly, because it's John Williams theme and everyone's going to go. Yep, that's Indiana Jones. Right. But generally speaking, I mean, a lot of times there's not any music in the score that really works for a trailer because it's it's made to fit with the scenes of the movie um not a hack i mean the the scenes of the movie are hacked up almost like i was talking about them hack the music i've got to imagine that the 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 video guys are looking at these trailers going what did you do to our cinematography and our <laughs> and like it's all just hacked up so badly right it's just chopped up and destroyed because they have to tell a two and a half hour story basically in two and a half minutes for, right. for advertising purposes. And so everything's chopped up and condensed. And I think a lot of it really is, I think they've gone away from it and gone with these big bombastic sounds just because, um, you know, attention spans of people are so small now that you, you really have to smack them in the face with advertising. Like you can't get away with subtle advertising. Everything has to be over the top and just extreme. And I, I kind of hope it changes, honestly, and kind of eases back to where you can have some nice, pleasant music during trailers and, and everything isn't cranked up and loudness war and all that. And, and maybe it will eventually, but I think honestly, it's because that's what people expect. Um, you know, you don't, it's kind of like movies. You, you go watch a movie from 30 years ago that you loved and you're like, wow, that's really slow and hard to watch now because they didn't, edit it the way they edit movies these days they kind of cater to our tiny attention spans and make everything move 10 times faster than it used to and i think the music is just kind of caught up to that with the trailers and advertising when will it ever end you know i mean <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> um, technology has made it such that from a um a biologic standpoint we still have the same brains that we had 100 years right. ago or 200 years ago but we've been trained by TikTok that everything right. can happen in a really short span at some point is it going to be you just see like a flash of red and that was the whole trailer you know right i know for Boom. real that's kind of how i feel like, <laughs> yeah wow, I, I think i want to see that i'm not sure uh, let's talk about fallout music group which um all right I, i'm really I hate to keep saying the word proud, but uh, I have a deep level of respect for anybody who does something entrepreneurial. And Fallout Music Group, um, tell everybody what it is, why you started it, and then we'll talk about how that plays okay. into all this. Sure. So, um, so we make, basically make contact instruments, um, you know, native instruments contact uh, sampler. So we build instruments for composers to use. Um, we don't do sound packs and wave files to drop into your music like a lot of companies do. We, we especially make instruments. Um, a lot of them are sound effect instruments for trailers. So they're all geared toward uh, risers and brams and uh, whoosh effects and things like that. Um, and mostly, honestly, we started it because we were kind of tired of the instruments that were available at the time because a lot of them were just like, yeah, you'd buy a sound pack of, of wave files with risers and you'd buy a sound pack of hits and whooshes and things like that. But everyone had the same ones. And so you're like, 
always trying to find ways to use them and manipulate them to sound a little different so that everybody didn't say, hey, that's that hit from damage or hey, that's that that's that Bram from, you know, uh, whatever sample tracks or who, you know, your company. Yeah. And these these companies made really good sounds. Uh, I'm not trying to dog on them at all. Really cool stuff, but it was very recognizable and and you're stuck with just a wave file. So um, we decided, especially with risers, we were tired of that. We wanted to build an instrument that could build, you know, basically allow you to make your own risers out of a whole bunch of different source material without being a sound designer that knew how to do all that stuff. And so we built our first instrument, um, Ascendance, to do the risers. and it you know did all right and people really seemed to like it and so we just kind of kept going from there and always trying to think of what would we use when we're composing that doesn't exist on the market yet uh, the way we would want to use it what happens then if i think i know the answer but i'm gonna pretend that i don't um all right like i could be wrong but what happens if somebody uses one of your things they they go into um the instrument Excuse me. Oh, did you sample that? Um, what happens if they <laughs> if they go into the instrument and, and, and they pull up a riser and uh-huh. and they love it just as it is and yep. they they end up sending it and they get a, a theatrical trailer and the Fallout Music Group riser is in there and they sent stems off to the editor because the editor said send me stems. And the right. editor, in his or her infinite wisdom, uses just the riser in the clear for some right. reason. Who gets paid for that? Does Fallout get paid for it because it's your riser? Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? No, no, we wouldn't have anything to do with it. It would be the composer that got paid for it. Um, and and technically speaking, and this is the same for every one of these instrument manufacturers, technically you'd be violating your terms of use agreement by using the samples all standalone like that um you know i'm not going to be going out and listening for it and trying to hunt people down if that happens because i know how things go with stems like that you know yeah Um, it it probably had nothing to do with the composer Yeah, yeah exactly um so you know that's just my take on it but Generally speaking, and I, I kind of tell this to people, because I, I get that question a lot from people thinking of buying our instruments. Um, can I use this for a sound design album? And I just kind of tell them, look, yes, you can use it, but mix it with other things. Put your own stuff on top of it. Don't just play it by itself, because that could get you into trouble. So you know, that's kind of the general rule, is at least mix it with a couple of other elements from your own palette of sounds or even other companies, so it's not just a straight up sample out of the box um, and then you're generally safe but no I wouldn't see it of that the only money we get is when people buy our instruments and eat, and that's it okay um, and, and you guys uh, created one instrument that was found sounds like let's say the sound of a thumbnail going over a comb and then you right. <laughs> bastardize it, adulterate it, do whatever you do to it. But you make all these different possibilities available. But what I found right. fascinating, I spent a lot of time on that one actually, and it's that anybody could and may very well think of what you guys have offered. You just make it really easy to use so that you don't waste a lot right. of time creating these layers and layers of stuff on top of the thumbnail on the comb. Um, <laughs> it's kind of all right. there, which I thought and was that's, really And that was cool. kind of our goal, yeah, because we were just sick of spending that much time. I mean, so we just released the, the trailer Brahms 2 instrument a couple of months ago. Um, and that one was a long time in the making because that was another one we were all sick of Brahms from other companies and stuff because you either couldn't change them or you couldn't change the key. You know, they they were made on a single key. All the layers were baked in. And so we wanted to create something that made it really easy to just make your own and be able to play it over a full octave and and have different keys. And so, yeah, we set out to create that. And, you know, once we were done and I started playing with it, I was like, legitimately, I've never used anything else since because I can do everything I want in it. So I I kind of feel spoiled because I, you know, we create these things almost for ourselves, but they are just a ton of work. I mean, you know, 
so we, we sell them to make some of that, uh, make it so we're not working for free. Um, but yeah, the, the, the amount of time that's spent making them far exceeds what we sell them for, that's for sure. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a crazy amount of work, but it's, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's nice to see them get used out in the community and people always email me and say, hey, that just showed up in this trailer, by the way. I used your risers in this trailer or that and I, I used your horror strings in, you know, several movie trailers. In fact, uh, our, our horror strings are in a very popular movie soundtrack as well. I won't say which because the composer didn't tell me I could. But um, yeah, it's, it's fun to hear those things out there getting used and and people always say the same thing, like, I love that it's easy to use and I can make my own sound without knowing someone else down the road is using the exact same wave file, so. Can I totally put you on the spot and have you donate one of your instruments to the person who plops the best question in the comments under this video yeah. during the next 24 hours only. Not a week from now, sure. not two days from now, but 24 hours by 4 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesday. Whoever uh -huh. puts the best, most intelligent question, and I'm gonna let <laughs> Randon look at him and say, right. that's a great question. You will get your choice of one of their instruments. Yeah, Is sure. that, any, any one of them. Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, and you guys should get familiar with the instruments because you may very well win one. Go to falloutmusicgroup.com. Um, you'll be quite amazed. I mean, you know, when Randon first told me about this, I knew it would be cool because I know how hard he works and how serious he is about stuff. He doesn't do things in a half-assed manner. He either does them and does them really well or he just says, nope, not, don't have the time to do it as well as I'd like. Let's move on. So as I checked these things out, I went, wow, back when I used to do audio post in the Jurassic period of like 1983 <laughs> to 1992, I could have used that stuff all day long. I was doing TV commercials, you know, like right. big commercials for major brands all the time. And that stuff would have been great for it. So right, you guys yeah. should go check it out and then you'll know which one you want to ask for when you win by you asking go. a really good question. Um, I'm going to check and see if there's anything super intelligent that I was going to ask that I haven't. I think I've covered it all. Um, oh, yeah. One last thing, and then we're going to open it up. So start thinking of your questions. Okay. We'll take the last 15 minutes. You guys can ask Randon anything you want. Um, you mentioned in your email to me that you're starting to score some film projects uh, with your boss. Yeah. And that you also landed a scoring gig on an animated thing, I think you mentioned. Yeah. Um, tell everybody what it's like shifting gears, going from creating music in an imaginary scenario. Like, I'm going to make this piece, you know, a, a attention piece, or this one's going to be... Um, light and carefree whatever the mood that you're going for you're creating it in the blind hoping that you've done a good enough right. job of conveying an emotion a feeling whatever that somebody will find that works really well in their scene now you're working to picture looking at the stuff how has that transition been for you <laughs> uh night and day i mean it's it's weird thankfully my boss is really cool and uh doesn't mind holding hand to you know help me out but uh it is weird because when you're watching scenes from a movie that don't have any music playing, you don't realize just how important that music is until you watch a movie without it. And you're like, I'm, I'm not even sure sometimes what mood they're going for. Now, it helps that there's usually a, mu a music supervisor on films as well that might put in some temp music to kind of as they're as they're editing. They put in some temp music that says, oh, this is kind of the vibe I'm going for, or this type of mood. Now, granted, I have very limited experience in this, but from what I know and what I've experienced uh, is that the temp music is a very, very rough guide because if you go too close to the temp music, they usually yeah. come back and say, no, that's not what we actually wanted. That was just something we stuck in there. <laughs> but but a, lot, a lot of times it does at least serve as a general kind of mood so you're like okay there i couldn't quite pick up on it from the actors but 
this is supposed to be a tension building kind of area of the score. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a trick because, you know, especially if there's multiple people working on it, you don't always know the whole story of the movie and, and you're, you've got your little scenes that you're going to work on, but you don't really know what was going on for the previous 15 minutes, uh, leading up to that. So it is a little weird, um, making that transition and having to fit to the emotions going on screen and the timing of the scenes you know adjusting your music to fit the timing of the scene changes and, and everything it's a it's a very different world um, but it's fun and any sense if you like it better or less better than, than what you normally I, do i would say it's just the same honestly i it's kind of you know like when I'm I'm writing music or doing sound design or doing that uh, for scoring, it's just so different that I just kind of like all of it. So it's kind of nice not to do the same thing over and over again. So, you know, if, if my work throws me a bone and gives me like a sound design album to do, it's always a nice break from, you know, doing several cues for various other albums. Uh, to take a break and just do sound design for a week is kind of like a breath of fresh air. But after about a week, I... I wouldn't want to do another one for another few weeks. I'd want to jump and wow. do some music. So it's definitely nice to have the variety. I don't know that I'd want to do any one of these things constantly without mixing it up a little bit. All right, let's jump into questions from our All viewers. Right. Um, and I want to tell everybody, I see people starting to do it already. If you could be kind enough to type the word question in all caps, it makes it easier for me to spot. We're going to answer them kind of quickly because we've got 13 minutes and change left here. So we'll do kind of a lightning round. First question is from David Berube. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Have you ever been asked to compose a TV promo for a program that you hate? And if so, how do you find the inspiration? <laughs> That's a great um, question. <laughs> that is a great question. No, I, I haven't because nine times out of 10, uh, you're you're writing tv promo music for a, an album as opposed to for an actual ad like, yeah um and so you don't even know what it's going to be used for so you're writing it in a kind of generic fashion like you might be working on an album that's gearing up to do like samsung or iphone ad type music right they kind of tend to use the same types of sound so you might do an album of those and then you might do an album of something that's more for I don't know deodorant ads for I don't know car ads doesn't matter but uh, yeah <laughs> um, so that's more what you're doing it, it the the customs that come in for are usually more for trailers and things than um, than TV ads from what in, from my experience I'm sure that other composers have a very different experience with that but no I've never had to write anything for something I I hate thank goodness <laughs> that would be rough I got to say there were some albums I worked on back when I was still engineering records where I literally hated the artist and didn't like the music and it was just torture. So yeah, you don't want to be <laughs> in that position. Um, here's a question from Marion Laird. I heard World of Warcraft go by. Was that a trailer or music for the game itself? And which expansion pack was that? World of okay. Warcraft's music is great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, Marion. Um, so that was for ads for uh, world of warcraft trailers and i i've done several over the last year for world of warcraft they've used my a few of my tracks several times on various ads I honestly don't know which ones like it, which packs they go for it's really easy with tv because you get cue sheets or film trailers because they pay you and say hey we used your song and you know exactly what you did it for um, but with the video game ones, they tend to use them and they have so many ads, right? These video game trailers are played in various countries. They have you know, 50 different ads for each one of these packs that comes out. And they don't, there's no cue sheets to tell you which one you were on. And they, the only name you see is their internal naming structure for these ads, which are completely meaningless. Right. <laughs> you just know that it's World of Warcraft and there's like usually something in the name that tells you how long the queue was or the video was and that's pretty much it the rest of it is complete gibberish uh, <laughs> i've tried to go out and find some of them sometimes and it, i just got tired of looking because there's so many ads out there for these video games it's crazy and they and they may only use it in germany and you know various countries in europe 
and not in the U.S. or only in the U.S. And so finding them is rough. And, the, and so, yeah, I, wow. I wish I could answer that, but I can't. All right. I can you answer like seven or eight of them? <laughs> can you answer this one, which is from Alex Dillon? He wants to know how long does it take you to make a complete trailer? So let's assume that it's a big bombastic you know, action adventure thing. How how many hours of studio time and how many average tracks might that use? Um, okay, so average time probably eight to twelve hours, I would say, start to finish. Um unless it's a custom and they need it, you know, you find out in the morning that they need it that night, then you I might do it a little faster. Um that's probably I don't know, tracks, maybe seventy five or so. I I know there's guys out there who are like, I used 200 tracks on this song. Um, I'm not one of those guys. I tend to keep things a little simpler um, and try to make things sound big without just throwing everything at the wall. Um, so yeah, probably 75 to 100. Earlier you mentioned that uh, you know layering lots of strings or lots of whatever, could be brass, whatever, drums, um, to make it bigger. How is there a sonic way that you know you've gone too far. Um, yeah, how do you know if you use like six stereo passes of <laughs> strings versus 21? Where do you draw I mean, the line? thing is I usually don't start with all of them. I start with my favorite, you know, libraries. So I might have just, you know, the, the four sections of strings from one library and I'll do my composing with that and start building the track around that. And then I might be like, oh, those violins are getting buried. I'm going to throw something else on top of those. And so I do have some layers that I've built over time that I know I like that use two or three different libraries that if I need to go bigger, I know which ones I'm going to drag and add on top. Okay. Um, so it's, it's more of an adding than a taking away kind of thing for me. I don't just start with everything. I definitely start small and, and, and grow to where I like the sound of it. Uh, and do you, choose your different libraries to make those layers from based on i need more edge so i'm going to this library because yeah. their violas had you know a much grainier sound than yeah the, absolutely okay. and yeah and it's it's not like i i definitely use you know cellos from a couple of specific libraries and and then different libraries for my violas and violins sometimes uh, there's there's usually one or two libraries that find their way across the board but um yeah, I definitely find the ones that I like and the ones that I think work well together. And I just spent a few days one day, one week playing in some parts and mm -hmm. layering them together with these different libraries and hearing which ones I like the sound of. And I said, okay, that's the ones I want to use as my default. And if I need something else, I'll look for it. But I kind of saved off all of my favorite violin pairings and second violin pairings and viola pairings. So, yeah. Um, what are what's your stranded on a desert island can't live without this library uh, if you had to pick only one what would it be mm. and i want I one know. for strip one for strings and one for horns okay. dude <laughs> so if it was brass it would be um junkie xl's brass from orchestral tools okay that's just a killer for trailer music yeah uh, in particular um that's a monster and if I had to pick one drum library, it would probably be uh, Hans Zimmer percussion from Spitfire. Okay. The, the pro version of that one, um, which probably a lot of people roll their eyes on that one. I, I seem to be one of the only people that likes to use that in trailer music, but I love it. <laughs> um, and then strings, that's a rough one. Um, I'd probably snag... Um, I don't know. Probably. Okay. Uh, that just makes uh, what something is up. The name of that company. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was just thinking. It's it's. Uh, I uh, for some reason I can't think of the name. Cinematic Studio Strings. That's what it is. Okay. That's like if I had to have one that could do everything really well, that would be the one because it can do short, long, everything really well. Uh, here's a question from Richard Rock. Are I, I, ISRC codes ever used in any tracks or is everything uh, just cue sheets? Uh, just cue sheets, yeah. Okay. Um, wow, somebody said that this is fascinating. Good job, Randon. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good job, Michael. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
Uh, here's a question from Richard Carr. I come from an artist perspective. Is it needed on complete pieces of music for the PROs to get the right song paid? I'm not really understanding that, Richard. I, yeah. I think what he's saying is it needed on complete? Nah, I don't understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, scrolling down. Wow, this one, I don't know if you're going to be able to give a short answer for this one, but uh, Irina Shiloh wants to know, what's your work process mentally? Oh, yeah, that's, um, I'm a bit weird probably. Um, but what I do, <laughs> I I don't let myself get bogged down in the details. That's, that's the key because I often have to write something kind of on demand and in a very short time frame. And so I don't have the luxury of sitting around and like waiting for inspiration or watching movies to get inspired or anything like that. So it's really about just kind of clearing my head deciding on the, you know the mood and vibe that I need to go with plucking out my chords and just I just dive in and I just kind of start small like I said start with my chords and melody and kind of build out from there and um, by taking it in little baby steps I, I don't ever get stuck thinking of or, hmm. or worrying about the end result I just know that I need to build my my acts and I just start in the first one knowing where I need to go in the end and kind of work toward that goal. But um, yeah, I, I always start very small and with the important elements and come back, fill all of the things like risers and whooshes and hits and, and big effects. Um, that's all to enhance the music. So I start with the core music and then work backward and go fill in all the enhancements afterward. Do you ever have uh, the equivalent of writer's block that, you know, songwriters just can't find an inspiration or they had an inspiration and they get 20% in and go, <laughs> I don't know where the hell to go with this. So do, does that happen and what do you do um, when it does? It used to happen to me a lot more when I was writing songs. I hated that. Um, I don't really deal with that too much these days, honestly. Um, because I'll just, I'll just pull up an instrument, whether it's a piano or even a synth or something, and I'll just start playing through sounds and, or strings. I'll pull up a, a, an ensemble strings and just start playing chords to kind of clear my head. And usually, as I'm just messing around, I'll, I'll play a chord or something that really strikes a chord, huh? Good there? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and once it, once it hits me, then I'm like, okay, now I've got something to go with, and I'll, I'll just ride with it. But the key for me to avoid that is not to not to stop i might take a break for five minutes but i'll always come back and just start playing something even if it's unrelated to what i'm working on just to kind of keep it flowing and and hearing something and hoping for a new idea to kick in um but yeah like i said i don't usually have the time to i, I don't know what i'd do if i had a block and couldn't come up with anything so i just kind of force myself almost into playing with sounds until something inspires me yeah and some of it's probably muscle memory and you're just forcing yourself to rely on that muscle right that's done it a thousand times before right um, do you tend to write um on just like a straight up piano or do you sometimes choose to write on a synth because you know that particular patch lends itself to sounding ominous and right may, yeah you know um I'll always start with a piano like 99% of the time because that's what I grew up playing. And so I'll start with a piano just to get my chords. But then when, I'm, when I actually start the writing process of, of building the actual stuff that's going to get used, um, then I'll, I'll do that. I'll load up a pad from a, a synth that I know has the mood that I want and I'll, I'll play it in there. But I'll always start with the piano. It, it, it nine times out of 10 gets thrown out the piano it's just a little temp thing there to, to block out my chords and, and ideas. Um, but that's always my starting point. Um, do you mix the same day that you produce the whole track or do you like work on a Tuesday to finish it and then get up Wednesday yeah. morning and mix? It depends um, on the due date really. Um, but most of the time I'm pretty comfortable mixing it. A lot of the stuff I do goes to a, a, a mixing engineer anyway. The stems oh, okay. go to a mixing engineer. Um, so I just have to have a pretty good mix and I kind of know 
you know, I kind of have some templates set up for my mixes, so I don't have to think about it too much if it's a standard kind of piece of trailer music. Um, but, you know, if I have the luxury of time, I'll sleep on it and then mix the next day. How many hours a day do you typically work? Um, well, let's see. Counting my Fallout stuff, I would say yeah. probably 14, 12 to okay. 14. <laughs> I, I know that. I definitely know that feeling. And you know what? Every successful person that I've ever asked that question of, with the exception of one, I've got one friend who works about 15, 20 hours a week and makes multiples, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I need to talk to him. Yeah, cl <laughs> clearly <laughs> it's a him and I hate him. I'm so jealous. Of the, it's like, dude, how do you do that? But he's very much right. into automating processes. So I think that's right. some of it, but good for him. I'm, I'm proud yeah. of him. And uh, I used to be his mentor and now he's made the, uh, the student has run many, many, many laps right. around, around the teacher. Um, oh yeah, we're out of time. Shoot, we're a minute and a half over. Oh. All right. Uh, so remember everybody, first of all, anybody who hasn't hit the like button during this episode has absolutely no chance whatsoever of winning a free instrument from Fallout <laughs> Music Group which can be found at falloutmusicgroup.com. And by the way, Randon didn't know in advance that I was going to ask him that, nor did he ask me to plug his software. <laughs> and as long as we're plugging stuff, tell everybody where they can find out more about the course you're going to teach, because I know oh. you well enough to know that it's going to be incredibly good. Thank you. And it's, it is a fun course. I've had a good time making it. Um, so check out uh, masterthescore.com. Um, they're going to have a ton of courses coming this year that are just going to be phenomenal. So, yeah, definitely worth checking out. And there should be some in light information up there on my course that's coming out soon. Awesome. I'm just checking my final notes to see if there's anything I've got to say. Oh, yes. Next week's show will be at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and I actually do have something written on the calendar for next week's show. Unfortunately, the calendar is not in the same room that I am. So, You'll just have to hear about it in an email, but I guarantee you it'll be really, really good. And then don't forget to go into this show as soon as it's done rendering on YouTube, which will be shortly after the show wraps. Write in a question and rand in tomorrow, 24 hours. So 4 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow is the cutoff to get that question in there. Randon will pick the best question. He will answer it in the chat or in the comment area. And whoever the person is that he selects, and I'll give you his address later for all the people that don't get picked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Randon will pick the best question. He'll answer it. And then he'll reach out to me uh, and we will connect you so that you can get some awesome free stuff of your choice from Fallout Music Group. All right. Um, That's great. Randon, thank you, man. I always love having you on the show. You, oh, thanks. You make fun. it. You make it sound so easy, um, <laughs> and and I know how hard you work, so I know it's not. But uh, I also love the fact that I, I've been in the industry long enough, and in many aspects of it, that I think I know a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff. Every single time I talk to you, I learn something new. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, great to see you. Give my best to your yeah, family. You uh, tell them I said thanks for not going on any Wi-Fi for the last 90 minutes. <laughs> and I'll, I'll see all the rest of you guys next week, 4 p.m. Pacific time, for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. <laughs> <laughs>